If you've got your Bibles, this is my last time to speak to you. I'd like to take just a very short few minutes to help us think through mission paralysis. Turn with me to Acts chapter 15. I want to show you in a series of stories, one after another, three dangers that have the ability to paralyze our mission advance. I want to begin with the story of Paul and Barnabas getting in a fight. Seems to me they might have been Baptist. <laughs> fighting, fighting with each other. Acts chapter 15, we're going to begin in verse 36, and we're going to make our way down into a little bit of Acts chapter 16. Y'all, if you don't mind, let's honor the reading of God's word by standing together as we read. After some time had passed, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the brothers and sisters in every town where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take along John Mark, but Paul insisted that they should not take along this man who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone on with them to their work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company, and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed off to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed after being commended by the brothers and sisters to the grace of the Lord. He traveled through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Paul went on to Derbe and Lystra, where there was a disciple named Timothy, the son of a believing Jewish woman, but his father was a Greek. The brothers and sisters at Lystra and Iconium spoke highly of him. Paul wanted Timothy to go with him, so he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, since they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled through the towns, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem for the people to observe, so the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they grew daily in numbers. And then they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, though they had been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they came to Mysia, they tried to go into Bith- Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and during the night Paul had a vision in which a Macedonian man was standing and pleading with him, cross over to Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, we immediately made efforts to set out for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And from Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Samothrace the next day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, a Roman colony and a leading city of the district of Macedonia. And we stayed in that city for several days, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the city gate by the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and spoke to the woman uh, women gathered there, and a God-fearing woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, was listening. The Lord opened her heart to respond to what Paul was saying, and after she and her household were baptized, she urged us, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house, and she persuaded us. Have a seat. In this story of the advance of the first century church, we come across three specific instances that threatened to derail the advancement of the gospel. And all three of them persist in the church today. And if we don't approach them appropriately, if we don't think about them rightly, we'll find our own churches, and many of us maybe have already found our own churches, in danger of allowing these to paralyze gospel work among us. The first thing I want you to notice is the danger of disagreement. Paul and Barnabas get into a fight with each other. They're upset over what to do about John Mark. Barnabas is cousins with John Mark. They're they're cousins with one another. And as such, he wanted to take John Mark with him. Now, the problem was John Mark had been with them earlier and had deserted them in their work. He was likely a young man, and who knows why, probably something related to his immaturity. He abandoned their work, and Paul, a rather relentless and somewhat uh, black and white sort of guy, very uh, concrete sort of individual in the way he saw the world, wanted to say we were done with him. They didn't want anything more to do with him at that point. And so they had this disagreement over it. What's interesting to me is how Barnabas handled the disagreement. Barnabas could have insisted, no, we're going to bring him along with us. We're going to, uh, we're going to, to, to sort of force this among us. And yet he doesn't do that. Instead, Barnabas recognizes that this is a disagreement that probably is going to keep them from being able to walk forward together. But instead, he remains friends with him. They part company and the gospel is advanced. 
This is important for us. Now, we talked a few minutes ago about loving one another and unifying together and partnering together, and that's such a vital need for the church of Jesus Christ. But the reality is there are always going to be some things that are going to impede our ability to make progress together, and they're real. It could be something is just a leadership disagreement. It's interesting to me that Barnabas and Paul disagree and part company not over any theological position. They part company over a leadership decision, and yet God uses this to see the gospel advance. We're going to find ways in which we should partner together, but there are going to come times in which we are not able to continue together. I love Ed Stetzer, who used to be my boss. We used to talk about this. He said, Baptists and Presbyterians can partner together for evangelism, but church planning is going to become difficult because at some point, somebody's going to come to Jesus, need to be baptized, and we have to decide whether we need a bathtub or a bowl, and that's where we're going to part company, right? We're going to have a difficult time making the decision of how we're going to be able to deliberate on together. My greatest influences in my life, I'm a Baptist, but my greatest influences in my life are a Presbyterian, Tim Keller, an Anglican, N.T. Wright. I love these influences in my life, but there are going to be points in which disagreement would disallow us from being able to walk forward together. But even as we choose to walk forward in different ways, we do so, or at least on my part, with my blessing and my prayers for the success of their ministry, right? We see this in this context. They come to this conclusion. We can't walk forward together, and yet the blessings of God go on you. We pray that the blessings of God would continue in your life and in your ministry, and we advocate for each other even in that regard. Disagreement is going to be in our midst. In fact, what's intriguing about this is they've just come off the heels of a massive theological disagreement. The Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. What do we do with those who are not Jews and who are coming to faith in Christ and they come to the conclusion that they should not require the Judaizers to succeed, that no Gentile has to become a Jew to continue in the faith. And yet, that leads us to the next potential uh, issue that could paralyze the advance of the gospel, and that is the question of our discernment. First we see disagreement, then we see Discernment. Barnabas and Paul part ways. Barnabas takes John Mark, Paul takes Silas, and they, uh, they go and they depart. And the Bible says in the beginning of chapter 16 that Paul goes to Derby and Lystra and there meets this young man named Timothy. Now we know that Timothy would go on to become Paul's son in the faith, but Timothy uh, was an interesting character. Paul, of course, was, as the Bible defines him, a Jew of all Jews, right? From the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee of Pharisees. And yet Timothy is not like this. Timothy is born to a mother who is a believing Jew and a father who is a Gentile. He comes from different ethnic backgrounds, different ethnic heritages, different cultural traditions. And Paul adopts Timothy in a way, brings him under his wing and then seeks to go out and advance the gospel with Timothy. And what's interesting is the text tells us specifically in verse 4 of chapter 16 that that which they were doing was going from town to town, church to church, spreading the news of the decision of the Jerusalem council. And the Jerusalem council's decision was we're not going to force Gentiles to become Jews, to become Christian. And yet what does Paul do with Timothy in chapter 16? He forces him to be circumcised. Now, why would Paul do this? Paul was just part of the Jerusalem council where Paul, and together with the other leaders, deliberated together and determined that they wouldn't require anyone to become a Jew. Why is Paul enforcing this on Timothy? Because Paul understood and was a discerning man. Paul understood the concept of contextualization that we discussed last night. Paul knew with absolute certainty that no Gentile had to become a Jew to walk faithfully with Jesus. But Paul also knew that in order for Paul's ministry to flourish, the most effective thing he could do would be to have Timothy circumcised in an effort to, not, to, 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 to break down every potential wall that would be a barrier to the gospel. He did this at great sacrifice, particularly on Timothy's part. Y'all try that in your discipleship techniques from now on to all the young men. Come follow me, but first we need to have a little procedure. (laughs) You're not going to have very many people following you. 
But that's what Paul does. Why? Great personal sacrifice, but he understood that it was going to become a barrier to the gospel, and so the advance of the gospel mattered more. So Paul, in his wisdom and discernment, though he would not impose it on the church as a whole, imposed it on this young disciple who was following him because he did not want to impede the progress of the gospel. Disagreement could potentially derail the gospel. Our question of discernment could potentially derail the gospel. I've watched this happen all around the world where we fail to discern our context and rightly communicate the gospel, and it impedes the progress of the gospel. You all know that in the African context, particularly in the rural African context, bad Western missions for years has fostered dependence which has destroyed the advance of the gospel. I remember my wife and I serving in Burkina, and we, had, we were church planting in a various villages, and we had a, a village chief one day show up in our yard. And he sat down, and we sat under the mango tree, and I was making tea. And uh, we went through the pleasantries, and then he got to the point of his visit. He said, I want you to come to my village. I hear that you have the gospel. Will you bring the gospel to my village? We were ecstatic. It was the first time this had ever happened. We'd never had this happen. This was the answer to our prayers. And so we did. The very next week, we, we went out, and I took my djembe, and we played music, and we sang, and then we began to, to, to walk through the story of the gospel with them, and we celebrated so much, and we came back to our home, and about three days later, the village chief showed up in our yard, and he said, where's my radio? And I said, what do you mean, where's your radio? He said, well, I've been told that that's what missionaries do. That's why I invited you to my village. We actually gave them the same words that Ternay said just a moment ago, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. We're here to bring Jesus. And he shut access off to the gospel, never allowed us to come back in with the gospel. Now, it would have been easy, I guess, for us to maybe give a radio in that instance. But what worries me, what concerned me, was that bad mission strategy, a lack of wise discernment from those who had come before us impeded the ability of the gospel to progress. Disagreement, discernment, and finally, the question of desire. This is significant. Paul wants to go on to Asia. He wants the gospel to go to Asia. If you will, if I could use modern vernacular, Paul has a vision to take the gospel to Asia. But God says no. One of the greatest dangers or threats to the advance of the gospel is our unwillingness and our inability to submit our plans, preferences, and desires under the authority of God and his leadership. We've arrived at a point in time in our lives where we've made ourselves and our plans and our desires, our goals and our personalities, the object of our affection and the center of our ambition. It's intriguing to me how often as a pastor, I have somebody come to me and say, Pastor, God has spoken to me and this is what we need to do. How do you disagree with that? You can't disagree with it. There's no objective way to disagree with it. The problem is, as a pastor, I don't know whether God has spoken to them or whether they just ate roast beef too late last night and their stomach feels sort of funny and they're interpreting that as the Holy Spirit, right? I don't know. I have to submit everything that they do under the authority of the word of God and the wisdom of our pastoral leadership at our church as we deliberate together. Paul wants to go. And wouldn't you think that there's no greater plan and aim than to take the gospel where it had not yet been preached? This is Paul's desire, Romans chapter 15. And yet God in his wisdom and discernment said no, and Paul, to his credit, listened to the voice of God and avoided going where, or trying to take the gospel where God had said no, and instead found himself at a place where Lydia is sitting. And Lydia, this faithful woman, becomes the catalyst for this local church plant. Why? Because they submitted themselves and their plans and their leadership to the authority of God, followed where God called them to go, and God began to foster and grow his church. God's plans are far better than our own. I want to close by saying this. God has gifted the men and women in this room. As we said yesterday when we looked at Jeremiah chapter 29 in the very beginning of our time together, God has placed you where you are. I deeply love Africa. 
I love, love, love so much this continent. It was my home for a while. It's, my, it's where my son is from. I've worked in West Africa and North Africa, Southern Africa. It's just, it's one of the most beautiful places on the planet. And I've traveled all over the world. And I'm so thankful that God has gifted you and called you and placed you here at this unique moment where you are blessed to be a part of history, where literally the center of global Christianity has now rotated to to Southern Africa. This is home to the greatest force for the gospel. But it can fail and it can end. You don't believe that's the case? Go back and look at Turkey then Western Europe, then the United States, and now Africa. The gospel has moved from each of those places over the last 2,000 years. You, more so than any other people on planet Earth right now, have been trusted with a stewardship. You will be the church that will influence the global church for the next 100, 200, and 300 years. Guard this trust with great diligence. Be accountable and faithful to advance the gospel and don't allow things like disagreement or bad Western missiology that leads to bad discernment or even things like misplaced desire to disrupt the movement of God that God is doing on this gloriously beautiful continent called Africa. Because I'm telling you, My church in the U.S. desperately needs the African church. We need what God is doing here. The fresh wind that is moving across this continent is not happening in my part of the world. The church is growing stale and cold and lethargic. We need what God is doing among you. I beg of you, don't allow that to be disrupted under your watch. Let me pray. Jesus, I pray for the men and the women in this room. I pray that you will be, already are, and will be continuing to raise up among them a mighty movement of God, an army of gospel soldiers who will go with the gospel. Holy Spirit of God, we pray that you would be moving among them, catalyzing their hearts and their minds, their will and their desire to see this movement of the gospel marching forward, that the entire globe might be impacted by what God is doing here in Africa. We heard Michael a few minutes ago talking about the growth of Johannesburg, the growth of Lagos, which in the next 20 years should become the largest city, not just on the African continent, but in the entire world. Lord, as you continue to prosper this continent, I pray as the growth occurs that the gospel would continue to set down deep, deep, rich roots and that the fruit of the gospel tree that's being planted on this, on this continent would literally benefit, would serve, would feed the global church and that we would see continued movements of God around the world because what you are doing in this place through these men and women. Lord, please find them, find me, find us faithful as we steward your gospel. Lord, we love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.